Hello, everybody. Um, we're just, I'm going to vamp for a few seconds. I think uh, there's a few more participants who are waiting to show up here. Um, one thing we'd love to hear where you're coming, where you're joining us from. So uh, if you can find the chat function on your, or even in the Q&A area, if you want to just let us know um, where you're joining us from today. Ooh, someone from Roebling, New Jersey. What a surprise. <laughs> All right, so um, welcome. My name is Lynn Calamia. I'm the new executive director at Roebling Museum. I started in February, so very new. Um, the, what we're gonna be doing today, this program is called Roebling Road Trip and it's a new thing we're doing. This is actually our first official webinar lecture and it's actually my first time running one so please let's all be gentle as we figure out how to make this flow um, so Roebling Road Trip, Trip in general is going to be a series of lectures that we're doing where we virtually transport you to different uh, Roebling sites around the country it could be around the world if we get some more ideas um, but for right now uh, we're going to be on the Ohio River today um, next, and this hasn't been announced widely, but our next one is actually going to be um, on Saxonburg, Pennsylvania, which you will learn about a little bit today. It's going to be good. And that's going to be on October 14th. There will be, uh, anybody who signed up for this will be on our email list to hear about the ones that are coming up next. And if anybody has ideas after this program of places that we should be going or people that we should be talking to at other Roebling sites. I'd love to hear them because we're always looking for um, new ideas. Um, so just really quick, I wanted to talk and, and I want my intro to be real quick so we can get right into it, the reason why we're here, Don. Um, but I just want to say a little bit about Roebling Museum. Roebling Museum is located in the company town of Roebling, New Jersey, which was built by the Roebling Company which was run by the Roebling family. I'm trying to figure out a way to say Roebling less when I discuss the, uh, our museum, but it's going to be tough. Um, ultimately, we're located in central New Jersey, right on the Delaware River, and we are within the company town that was built in 1905. And it remains almost fully intact architecturally, so it's just great to see. Um, our museum is on the site of the former factory and we have both indoor and outdoor exhibits to bring the life of the, to bring to life the story of the people who lived and worked in Roebling, as well as the big impact that the Roebling family and the Roebling company had um, just in general. So it's a really interesting place. I hope you'll add us to your list of places to go post pandemic. And we are trying to put together a pop-up day where we open to the public and allow tours with time tickets and all that. Um, so, since you signed up for this, you'll also be on the list to hear if we are uh, or when we are going to be putting that together. So last thing in terms of Fort Lauderdale. Wow, Florida. Um, the last thing I just want to mention in terms of housekeeping is how today's program is going to run. So I'm going to do this intro stuff. Then Don is going to give us an illustrated lecture about the bridge that he's going to speak about today. I don't, I don't want to give any spoilers. Um, and then while he's talking, um, you can be submitting questions. So there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, please, like normally, if this was a lecture in real life, we'd tell you to save your questions to the end, but type them as you think them. And I'm going to be looking through that and managing it while he's talking. So then when he's finished, um, I will take those questions and ask. So it'll turn into like a conversation between me and him, but we'll be using the questions that you submit. So think of some good ones and submit them, please. Um, so uh, I guess we can get to the program. So without further ado, let's get started. Don, you're up. Okay, well, thank you, Lynn, uh, very much for um, invited me to participate in this program, which has caused me to learn about Zoom. So I appreciate that. So I will
see, I just have to start my video here. Okay, do you have everything on the screen now? Yes, the slides are up and your face is up. Okay, so we can then proceed. Okay. Yep, please do. Okay. Well, I'm glad to talk about John A. Roebling and his bridge on the Ohio River. And we see a view of it here, and I'll be talking about that. Roebling was a, an incredible person. How he accomplished all he did in a lifetime of 63 years is nothing short of amazing. He played the piano and the flute. He liked to discuss the nature of the universe. He designed 10 bridges and built nine of them. Three of them are still standing. He was an engineering genius and a Renaissance man. He was born on the 12th of June in 1806 in Mühlhausen, which is located in Thuringia in central Germany. And that is the blue state right in the center of this 19th century map of Germany. The family lived here in this building with the father's tobacco shop downstairs and the family residence was upstairs. There's a plaque in Roebling's honor on, on the front of the building. If you ever get to Mühlhausen and want to go there and visit that. Roebling wanted to become a Baumeister or a master builder. So he went to Berlin where he studied engineering as well as architecture at the Bau Akademie or building academy that was in Berlin. He also heard lectures by the philosopher Hegel at the University of Berlin. And here we see an image of Hegel in the lecture hall. Roebling was said to be the favorite student of Hegel. And the philosopher advised that America is the land of the future. And Roebling apparently read everything he could about the new world. This is a picture of Roebling's drawing of the chain link bridge at Bamberg in Bavaria, which was the topic of his thesis. And here we see the basic concept of a suspension bridge. Cables are strung over the towers and fastened to anchorages on the shoreline. Vertical suspenders are fastened to the cables and attached to the bed of the bridge to hold it aloft. Roebling wrote that the chains were not large enough to uh, bear excessive weight. Cold temperatures caused them to break and heat made them expand. So he was highly critical of uh, such a construction of a suspension bridge with chain links. In 1831, Roebling immigrated to America. And this is the title page of a translation of his travel diary that appeared in 1931, a century after it was published in Germany. He had become a supervisor after his studies uh, for the construction of roads, culverts, and small bridges in Prussia. But he became frustrated when his proposal for a suspension bridge was turned down. He briefly then opened a bookstore that published a book about immigration to America. Not surprisingly, Roebling and his brother, Carl, organized the Milhausen Immigration Society. In America, they founded the town of Sachsenburg, which is located 25 miles from Pittsburgh and later became known as Saxonburg. They avoided the South because of slavery, and they felt the, the West was just too far to travel and establish a settlement. Roebling's home has been nicely preserved in Saxonburg. In 1836, he married the daughter of the town's tailor, Johanna Herten, and they had nine children, five boys and four girls. The firstborn, Washington, was born in Saxonburg in 1837, and he became his father's right-hand man. 
Now, tired of farming, Roebling obtained a position with the state of Pennsylvania, working on canal and survey projects, and also became a U.S. citizen. In 1841, he opened a factory, which has also been uh, nicely preserved in Saxonburg, and it began producing iron wire rope. This had been invented in Germany in the 1830s, but Roebling was the first to produce it in America, and his business became a great success. He also published an article stressing the merits of iron rope and spoke at conferences as well about that. Okay, what is, what is wire rope? It consists of several strands of wire, each of which are, uh, consist of wires twisted together. You see a wire become twisted together, become a strand, and then the strand can be twisted together to, find, to, to uh, make rope such as you see shown here. This is a cross section of uh, what it looks like. And you can see how strong and durable uh, wire rope is. By this time, uh, the greater Cincinnati area was really booming and growing. Uh, the population had reached 120,000 by 1850. By 1846, Roebling had already constructed two suspension bridges in Pennsylvania and was acquiring a reputation as a noteworthy bridge builder. The idea of a bridge on the Ohio River had often been discussed. So a group of Kentuckians petitioned the Kentucky State Legislature for a charter uh, for the Covington and Cincinnati Bridge Company. It was granted in February, 1846, and Roebling was invited to survey the area. And this is what his initial plan looked like. He, he arrived in May, and four months later, he issued a report. And his plan called for a span uh, supported by a central tower in the middle of the river. And this aroused uh, a lot of objections uh, and criticism to it. Opponents claimed that a central tower would gather debris around it and uh, ice in the winter. It would cause the bridge to, uh, probably maybe cause the bridge to collapse. Uh, it might also affect the flow of the river, making travel difficult for flatboats and small craft. Steamboat operators claimed it might obstruct steamboats with a tall smokestack. Ferry boat operators claimed their business would, would suffer because people would be going back and forth across a bridge and they wouldn't be taking a ferry boat across the river back and forth between Kentucky and Ohio. Also, the businesses uh, in Cincinnati, they feared there would be a loss of business if people would start going across the river and, and shopping in northern Kentucky. Also, anti-slavery forces were opposed to the bridge um, because Kentucky at that time was a slave state and there were slave owners who uh, sat on the board of directors of the bridge company. So the Ohio legislature um, failed to approve a charter, but many were in favor of getting a bridge. And so a charter was finally approved in 1849 for the bridge company. But to placate all these opponents that I mentioned, uh, it stipulated that the bridge could not line up with streets on both sides of the river. Roebling called this adverse legislation and a regrettable blunder. Nothing happened anyway at the time because there were not enough funds to build, uh, start work on construction of a bridge. Uh, by this time, Roebling had moved his company to Trenton, New Jersey, which was a better location for his growing, growing business. Now, in the meantime, another engineer, Charles Ellett, 
built the first suspension bridge on the Ohio River at Wheeling, West Virginia in 1849. However, uh, due to a tremendous storm, it collapsed in 1854 and it had to be rebuilt the following year. Roebling analyzed the structural problems of Ellett's bridge. He felt it needed diagonal wire rope stays in addition to the vertical wire rope suspenders because this would strengthen and stabilize the bridge. Ellett followed the uh, French method of producing smaller cables, whereas Roebling consolidated them into one large cable. He also spun his cables right on the bridge rather than on land and then transported them to the site as Ellett had, had done. This made for a much better, tighter fit for the cables on, on the bridge. He also wrapped the finished cable with iron rope. His innovations could be seen on um, the bridge he completed in 1855, the Niagara Falls Suspension Bridge. It was a spectacular double-decker bridge uh, with the top level for trains and the bottom level for vehicles. And I, I think this bridge really was really a, a fantastic bridge, uh, really a masterpiece that he uh, produced there. Um, by 1856, funds had been raised to start construction on the bridge on the Ohio River, so uh, Roebling came back to the area. His plan now called for a bridge with two towers. You know, he took the criticism of the, the central tower and decided there needed to be two towers. He had two designs for, for the towers. Uh, one was Gothic, that you can see here, and the other was Romanesque. He decided on the latter for the bridge on, on the Ohio River and later used the Gothic style for the Brooklyn Bridge. In Covington, Roebling stayed at the home of a member of the board of the bridge company, which was located only several blocks away from uh, the bridge construction site. And this is one of the questions I, I, get, I often get about different things about the bridge and the rolling was one of the questions is where did he stay when he was in Covington? Uh, and this is where he initially uh, stayed. Uh, near the uh, bridge site in Covington is the Roebling Point bookstore. And this was the site of the bridge company's office. Uh, and it's a great place to get a cup of coffee and uh, and browse through the books there, many dealing with local history. And there are a couple of uh, books by myself there on the bridge that I'll mention some of them later, but just a great location. And it's nice to be in the bookstore and think about where actually Rowling had his office uh, inside that uh, building. So the work uh, started but um, it came to a, a, an abrupt halt because of the great financial panic of 1857. Banks were going, and railroads, businesses and companies across the country were going bankrupt. So everything came to a halt and the bridge company did not have the necessary funds to continue uh, work on the bridge. This is a picture of the uh, bridge site, the Ohio River, in 1862. And you can see in the upper left corner um, the partially completed tower on the Kentucky side of the river. Um, by this time, only two of the towers had been partially completed. Now, what happened was in 1862 was a, a Confederate army launched an offensive to conquer the area. And this resulted in the siege of Cincinnati in September of that year. So a pontoon bridge was constructed that you can see here to bring federal troops and the so-called squirrel 
hunters across the river to defend the area. The squirrel hunters were farmers from Ohio that brought their shotgun rifles and any weapon they could bring with them to defend the area. The, the Confederates of, of retreated when they saw all of the troops that were in place in northern Kentucky, but the potential threat kick-started interest as well as funding in the bridge. People could see we need to, uh, it's important to have a bridge not only for tr traffic between uh, uh, Kentucky and uh, Ohio, but it's uh, militarily very strategically important to have a bridge there, especially during the Civil War. So Robley returned in January 1863, and by May, work uh, resumed. Amos Schinkel um, became a member of the bridge company in 1856, and eventually its president, and he became the driving force in getting the finances in order to get the bridge completed. He had uh, made a fortune selling coal to steamboats on the Ohio River, and he owned several uh, steamboats as well. And he was no doubt the, the wealthiest man in the greater Cincinnati area. So a great person to have on the uh, board of the bridge company. In December 1864, Roebling's son of Washington mustered out of the Union Army. He joined his father as an assistant engineer and was in charge of construction in his father's absence. He had risen to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in um, the engineers in the Union Army. He had built bridges, done reconnaissance observation with a balloon, and he'd been in many battles and had even seen Lincoln on two occasions. By early 1865, work on the towers was completed and in October, a footbridge was constructed that you can see here uh, that uh, enabled people working on the bridge to uh, begin work on the cables. Uh, this work was supervised by Washington a steam, steamboat stationed near the bridge construction in the lower right uh, provided the necessary power. And that steamboat belonged to uh, Amos Schenkel. Each of the main cables contained a total of 5,180 individual wires. Each cable was 12 and a half inches in diameter and tightly wrapped with iron rope. Cable work was completed in June 1866, but there still remained um, some work to be done. Uh, vertical suspenders were hung from each of the cables to support the iron floor cross beams. The roadway was made of oak and pine, and diagonal stays were added to strengthen the bridge. A grand march was composed for the dedication of the bridge on New Year's Day, 1867. And from the reports, it was a freezing cold New Year's Day when the uh, bridge officially opened. At the same time, when, at the time when it opened, it was the longest suspension bridge in the world. A month earlier, on the 1st of December, the bridge was opened to pedestrian traffic. And in two days, 166,000 people crossed it. Uh, that was about two thirds of the population of the greater Cincinnati area. So just about everybody in the area who could walk and get around crossed the bridge. So this was a really a big deal when uh, people would start walking across the, the bridge and then on New Year's Day, it was open to uh, vehicular traffic. Um, during its construction, only two lives had been lost. Uh, estimates range from 20 to more than 30 for those who lost their lives on the Brooklyn Bridge Project. 
The bridge company set up toll houses at each end of the bridge and they hired employees to staff, staff them. The tolls were three cents for a pedestrian and 10 cents for a horse and cart. And you can see there are fair prices for hogs and sheep because people would drive livestock across the bridge to market and to the slaughterhouses in Cincinnati. So it wasn't just vehicles and wagons and people. There's a lot of, you know, hogs, <laughs> sheep and so on. There were cows and so on that were going across the bridge. Um, so they had to set up fares uh, for that as, as well. Now, while serving a site for a tower for the Brooklyn Bridge, a tragic accident occurred when a boat slammed into a dock where Roebling stood, crushing the toes of his right foot, causing them to be amputated. This led to his death in July 1869 as a result of tetanus, and his son Washington uh, took over as chief engineer for the Brooklyn Bridge Project, which was completed in 1883. In the ensuing years after the bridge was built on the Ohio River, the whole area just grew and, and developed uh, exponentially. And it was really due to the bridge, business and industry, cultural life, social life. There was so much interchange um, between all of Kentucky and, and Cincinnati, the Ohio side. And moreover, the bridge opened right after the conclusion of the Civil War. And Roebling himself wrote that he hoped that the bridge would be symbolic of bringing the nation together, bringing the, the South and the North together, in addition to all of the other economic, um, social and cultural uh, um, contributions it would make. It really had a symbolic meaning that uh, Roebling wrote about in his report on the, on the bridge. Now, by the 1880s, electric cars you were spreading all over the country and they had come to our area, to the greater Cincinnati area. And uh, a streetcar like that weighed about 20 tons, quite a bit more heavy than the wagons and carts that were going uh, across the bridge. And so to accommodate uh, this kind of traffic, uh, uh, the bridge company decided to seek proposals for the improvement and strengthening of, of the bridge. And a proposal was submitted by Wilhelm Hildenbrandt, who was a German engineer. And his proposal uh, was uh, accepted and he was appointed chief engineer for the reconstruction and strengthening of the bridge. He had been an assistant engineer um, let's see. Yeah, he had been an assistant engineer to Washington Roebling for the Brooklyn Bridge Project, and Washington had recommended him for the job. Another valuable person for the project was E.F. Farrington and he uh, served as assistant engineer. He had worked on the Brooklyn Bridge project and prior to that on the suspension bridge on the Ohio River. So you had two key persons working on the reconstruction of the bridge in the 1890s, uh, Hildenbrandt and Farrington. So from 1895 to 1899, the bridge was reconstructed to strengthen it. A second set of cables were added, there were new trusses, a strengthened roadway was added, and four anchorages. And here we see what the bridge looked like after reconstruction with the added truss work and the added cable going over the towers. The bridge uh, now could handle the weight of these streetcars. Um, I think two were allowed on it at a time. Uh, the bridge could also now, in the early 
20th century could deal with automobiles. And I think this is an interesting picture because it shows there were automobiles going on it, but over to the right, you can see there was still a horse and cart. So there, um, you know, you, there was horse traffic and car traffic still going on back and forth. Uh, tolls were paid at the toll booths on either side of the bridge. So here you see a car, uh, this on the Kentucky side, stopping at the, uh, the toll house and, and paying the toll uh, to get across the, the bridge. Uh, during the Great Flood of 1937, the bridge was the only bridge open on the entire 800 mile stretch on the Ohio River all the way from Ohio to Illinois. So anyone wanting to get to the other side had to come up to Covington on, on the Kentucky side or on the Ohio side. They had to come to Cincinnati and uh, cross the bridge here. So, um, you know, this is, uh, fire engines, food trucks, delivery trucks, they all had to come to this area and go across the bridge because there weren't any other bridges um, that were uh, passable at that time. In 1953, the bridge was acquired by the state of Kentucky for 4.2 million, and the wooden floor was replaced with metal grating so that when you drive over it with in the car, it has a kind of a humming sound to it. So it is now called the, hum uh, the singing bridge or the humming bridge because the sound it makes when you drive over it. The toll booths on the bridge were finally removed in 1963 when the Brent Spence Bridge opened as a toll-free bridge. And that, that is a little bit west of the Roebling Bridge and that carries I-75 across it. And, and a historic marker on the Covington side of the uh, riverfront provides the best known facts about the bridge such as that it was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1975. It also has the names of the of Roebling and Schenkel, one the engineer and the other the financier. It also describes uh, the bridge as the prototype for the Brooklyn Bridge, aside from the fact that they were both uh, designed by Roebling and being a suspension bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge has uh, ma made use of many of the same techniques that were used on, uh, on our bridge on the Ohio River. For example, Washington wrote that the cable making machinery for the Brooklyn Bridge was made on the same general plan as that it was used in, for the making of the cables for the suspension bridge with some minor changes uh, to uh, suit local requirements. And elsewhere, Washington, Washington in his report, reports that he wrote about the Brooklyn Bridge, he does mention here and now, he'll say this is the way we did it in, in uh, working on the Ohio Bridge. So it's, it's not only in the design, but a lot in the techniques um, that, were, that were, were in common. So, Locally, there's a lot of great pride uh, in our area, uh, greater Cincinnati area, calling this a prototype for the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, technically, some prefer to call it a predecessor because the Brooklyn Bridge is, of course, much larger. And in 1988, a uh, bronze statue of Roebling was created and is located on the Covington Riverfront on Riverside Drive. And I think it's really uh, a great statue that captures the, the spirit of the fa fascinating personality Roebling was endowed with. And it's another great place to, to come to visit um, near the, uh, the Covington side of the bridge. In 1992, the spheres and crosses on the top of the towers were returned. They were modeled after the originals that had been removed during the 1890s work on the bridge. They had been removed because of the uh, 
the second cable that was added to the bridge and uh, saddles were placed on the top of the tower so the cable could pass over them and they were replaced by a uh, domes. So it was, it was really great that in 1992, these um, sirs and crosses were, were um, brought back to the bridge. And what is uh, really interesting about them is they reflect the architectural flair that's characteristic of the bridges that Roblin built. He believed that a bridge should not only be a utilitarian structure, but it should be aesthetically appealing. And you can see that with his use of the Romanesque tower and then have putting these crosses on there. It's really a, a bridge is not only a, a great uh, work of engineering, but it's also a, a beautiful piece of architecture. Here we see the trusses the cables and the suspenders and stays on the sidewalk. And you can see the painted blue, the, the trusses are the, what was added uh, in the 1890s to, to strengthen the bridge. Here's the main cable along the sidewalk. And there's a nice, really great little walkway there. You can walk back and forth. And it's a, a favorite, favorite place for people to walk back and forth along the river front um, with some great sights of, of the river and uh, the area. And here we see the trusses at the midpoint of the bridge and you can see the the bed of the bridge, the metal grating that uh, when you ride across it, it has kind of a singing or humming sound. The bridge is really the major landmark in the area. We did celebrate its 150th anniversary in 2017. It is no doubt the most uh, photographed site in the area. There's no question about that. And um, you see it on TV stations um, and advertising and all over the place, there are pictures and images of the bridge really showing how popular the bridge is and, uh, and how well loved it is as a site. Now I serve as historian of the Roebling Bridge Committee and here you see the uh, website of the bridge if you'd like to visit that at some time. The, the Bridge Committee was founded in 1975 and its purpose is to promote public awareness of the importance of the bridge and it uh, sponsors tours and a photo contest annually. It also is responsible for placing flags on the bridge as well as the lights that you see here and they illuminate uh, the bridge and, uh, at night and it's just a beautiful sight and this is one thing that makes it so uh, highly desirable to for, for photographers, they, they like to take pictures of it in the, at night and then in the, in the daytime. Now, I have published several books on Roblin and the construction and reconstruction of the bridge. And uh, here's one of them, John A. Roblin and his suspension bridge on the Ohio River. This takes basically a biographical approach, uh, looking at him, who he was, what he was like, his personality, and his philosophy. And then after that, I put together uh, and edited Farrington's report on the technical aspects of the construction of the bridge because I found people were interested in the biography of Roblin, but they were interested in technical questions like how did they uh, produce the cables, how did they construct the towers, what kind of stone was used, etc. So those uh, two books are available and they were published by a regional history publishing house, the Little Miami Publishing Company. And there you see its website if anybody's interested. 
they might want to visit uh, that site and they can order them if they like. And that concludes my presentation of John A. Roebling and the suspension bridge he built on the Ohio River to give you um, a brief survey and overview of that. Great job, Don. I feel like I learned so much about your bridge. You are bridge <laughs> like you own it. <laughs> okay, so several questions have come in um, and I'm gonna go through them chronologically. So the ones that came in earlier in your presentation, um, it starts with, where did the wire for the bridge come from? Was it made by the Roblin Company and shipped to Cincinnati? For the original construction of the bridge, the, the wire came from a company in Manchester, England. Why did it come from there? Well, the, the, the bridge was constructed during the Civil War. There was a great demand for iron uh, for the use and for the Union Army. So that's where the wire had to be obtained from England. For the reconstruction for the cables that were produced in the 1890s, they came from the Roebling's com Roebling Sons Company in Trenton. But it's kind of interesting. It show, shows the impact that the uh, Civil War did have on construction at that time. That is interesting. Um, I know who this one's from. I'm curious about the safety measures they use to have such a small death rate in constructing the bridge. Do you have anything to say about that? Well, they did have, uh, they were very fortunate that only two people did lose their lives, but I know that uh, they took great care in working on the bridge, but uh, Washington did write about how dangerous it could be working on the cables on the bridge because it, when you get down to the riverfront, it's quite windy and it just about blew him off uh, a couple of times, so he had to watch himself. Also, uh, I think they didn't worry about if, say, they dropped a tool or a hammer, and it said that beneath the bridge, the river bed was lined with tools and hammers and all kinds of equipment, <laughs> because they did drop a lot of things, but they seemed to have taken uh, extra care, and they did have boats down uh, below the bridge on the river, so I don't know if, if somebody did actually fall off, they could be, be rescued, but they were fortunate in, in that regard. Okay. Um, were the trusses painted blue always, or has that color changed? That color has changed. Uh, the bridge originally was uh, painted a, 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 a kind of a reddish brown color, and it has been painted several times throughout its history. At one time it was uh, painted uh, green, then at one time it was painted red, black, and white. And it's only been since the 1970s that it was uh, painted blue. So that is a recent color that it had. But originally it was kind of a reddish uh, brown color. Interesting. And it has been painted uh, since that time every now and then it does have to be repainted. So, and, uh, and that's been, been done many times. Did Cincinnati and Covington eventually line up their street grids to align with the bridge? No, they, they didn't, they did not. So when you, on both sides of the river, to get onto the bridge, you'll have to come down the street and then go to a yoke or a Y-shaped yoke so you can enter or onto the bridge and cross it. Uh, and it's kind of strange to me. So when you come off of the bridge, you, you face a yoke and you have to turn to the right or the left, uh, depending on which side of the br bridge you're on. And as, as Robley said, it was really a, a, you know, really a great blunder. That, but it goes back to, you know, the... Uh, position that uh, people in the Ohio legislature had 
with regard to the bridge company, which at, at that time had slaveholders on, on the on the uh, on the board. It just reminds us of, of the past history of when the bridge was uh, constructed. Um, so we have another question comment here. Um, it's interesting that your bridge committee was formed the year of the National Register listing, 1975. While the Brooklyn Bridge has always been celebrated, the 1983 centennial celebrations really started a new wave of affection and adulation. Sounds like your regional pride was more intense. <laughs> well, we do have a lot of tremendous pride in our bridge. I mean, it is a major landmark of, of the whole region. And uh, also when people were, you know, early on when people were coming down the Ohio River or coming up the Ohio River, they would know they had come to our area because they would see the bridge uh, that's there. The, you know, the other thing we could point out too is we're so happy that we have the name of Roebling attached to our bridge. And uh, I don't know, sometimes I have said, I wish the Brooklyn Bridge had Roebling's name on it. It's true. When I Google Roebling to learn things in general, what comes up is your bridge. Especially if uh, like Etsy and eBay, if I type in Roebling Bridge, you guys come up. Because <laughs> the name's right there in the title, of course it will. Well, and also of, of, the, of the 10 bridges that Roebling uh, designed, uh, there's only three that are still standing. The Brooklyn Bridge, our bridge, and the, um, the Aqueduct Bridge in Pennsylvania. So, you know, there's, that, that adds to the value, the historical value and importance of our bridge, uh, as well as the Brooklyn Bridge. Right, we got another one here. Um, did you come across anything about Emily Roebling in Cincinnati? Like, was she there? Yes, she was here. And she, if you read about Emily, she always accompanied Washington. And she was here. And, you know, another question I get is where did I mention, where did people stay when they were here? Well, one of the questions, you know, that I researched, where did Washington and Emily reside when they were here and that was not far from the bridge site uh, and near Sh Amos Schenkel's home and as a matter of fact there was a I mentioned how on New Year's Day how it was freezing cold well there was a newspaper article that was about Emily that she went ice skating on a the Licking River which is just uh, to the east of um, of where they resided. So she was always ice skating here and probably having a good time. But yeah, she was always uh, pretty at, usually at his side. So she was here. Um, was, hold on a second. I'm trying to answer one of the questions myself. I shouldn't have done that because now I lost my place. Um, sure. Did John A. Roebling have much of a public profile while he was in town? I, I think he did have a of course a public presence with, uh, in Covington working with a bridge company and also soliciting workers to work on the bridge. Um, there were advertisements for it in the local press to, for him to do that. And also I discovered that he liked to go across the river in the evening and socialize in in the German district here, it's called the Over the Rhine district. And there are references to him. I mentioned them in one of my books. He liked to go to some of the wine and beer gardens. And it's said too that he liked to discuss not only the bridge, but he would like to talk about philosophy, which was one of his major areas of interest since he had been a student of Hegel. So I think he did uh, enjoy himself here and uh, and uh, uh, one of uh, spinoff was uh, from that was too that he he gained investors in the uh, in the bridge company as a result of going out there and mixing with people in, in the community. So he, uh, I think he was social in that regard. And he, you know, he was such an eloquent speaker too, which uh, comes across in his writings and what what you. 
you um, what I've been able to find out about him. He, you know, very intelligent and well-spoken person. All right, we have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to ask you a very easy question. How did you get interested in Roebling, all things Roebling? Well, I write about German immigration, settlement, and influences, especially in the Ohio River Valley. And I, of course, was drawn to Roebling as a German immigrant because he's such a tremendous immigrant success story, how he came here. Uh, to establish a, uh, a community, a settlement, and then how he got back into his engineering trade and became such a tremendous uh, success story. And I always felt that people knew that we have the rolling bridge here, but they didn't know enough about him. And what I tried to do is to tell more about his personality and his philosophy and what he was like to give a kind of a, a closer, get you more in touch with him. And, and then they'll learn too more, of course, about the construction of the bridge. But I've always felt to understand a creation, you have to understand the creator. And I think it's important with, um, with Roebling, not just to understand the bridge and how it was built, but learn a little bit more about what this fascinating person who, you know, I call him a Renaissance man. I mean, he, he was just incredible. Uh, aside from being a, a, an engineering genius, he was just such a fascinating and interesting person. I agree. And one of my other questions that I just have for you is, you know, how how do you go to bridge school back when he was interested in learning about how to build bridges? And I think that goes to sort of the well-roundedness of his personality. And you really see that in his education too. Well, well you know, when you wanted to become a bridge builder, you have to do what, what Roebling did. He went to a, a building academy in Berlin and the kind of curriculum they had covered all the various branches of, of the building and construction trade, including bridge building, but that which was his focal point of interest. But he he studied architecture. He studied all of the, you know, and his initial uh, job uh, in Prussia was building roads, culverts, and, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, so... In the area of construction, um, he, he was well-rounded and, and it's very well reflected in what we got into bridge building. But, you know, the, you can see the influence of architecture, uh, his studies in architecture and the bridges he built because of the use of Gothic and Romanesque and, and so on. They're, they're really interesting pieces of architecture. I agree, and that's probably why it's such an icon and landmark in that area. Well, it contributes, yeah, it, it, it's one of the reasons that it's, um, the bridge is the most photographed site in the area because it's just such a thing of beauty. And there are other bridges that have been built on the Ohio River since World War II, such as uh, the Brent Spence Bridge. And um, they're, strictly speaking, utilitarian. Nobody would ever think of calling them a great work of architecture. Or, and I don't think any of them are photographed. <laughs> and, you know, another thing is everybody like, people like to come and get their pictures taken on the bridge, by the bridge, wedding parties, uh, couples, you know, families, reunions. People like to get their picture taken by the bridge. So, it, you know, it's just such a, a really popular place and a popular site in our area. All right, well, I think we've gotten to everybody's questions. Um, so let's all thank Don for coming and talking to us today. Um, someone said that your, your uh, presentation was fascinating and thank you for keeping history alive. <laughs> so, thank so you. Good much. work. Um, we'll we'll you. definitely stay in touch and we, we really appreciate it when um, you share our Facebook 
you know, we do some Facebook posts and I can tell that they're being shared in the Cincinnati area with other people who really love Roebling stuff. So thank you for that. And thanks for today. All right, bye. Bye.